to functions are proper to hearing, to perceive, and to obey. This teaching from the Arcana Celestia, the book of heavenly secrets, given to us in the new church, the church that adores the Lord in his second coming, reminds us that the external things, the things of the word, the things of our external life, all carry a deeper meaning. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing to really, really listen. And all listening will involve an element of turning or obeying. So the final lesson from Arcana Celestia 5017 talks about a circle of communication. And it applies to us working with one another, but it applies also to the Lord working with us. There is an interior meaning to hearing. There is an interior sense to the function of the ears. Sure, as we're little children, we learn how to listen, to hearken and obey. We sing songs about listening to the Lord and all that the Lord has spoken, we will hear and do. As we mature, we must apply all of those teachings to deeper and deeper, deeper levels in our understanding, but more importantly, when it comes to hearing, in our will. The Lord asks us, not just to hear his word, not just to know the teachings that are about him and about our neighbor, but more importantly, to hearken to those words, to hear and to obey. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord could just take us and change our hearts so we would all be obedient, and all become angels just like that, save us this misery and struggle? Some people might think that would be better. Some people, as they mature, long for the times when mommy and daddy just took care of things, just made everything all better. And yet we know the Lord wishes to give us a life that's autonomous, that's filled with freedom, because only within freedom can true, genuine joy come. And this applies to the way we listen and the way we hear and obey. Do you sometimes wish the Lord would sort of take you by the ear and gently guide you so that you would follow him? Maybe you'd make less mistakes, you say to yourself. If there was somebody sitting on my shoulder just telling me what to do all the time. The Lord wants us to use an internal sense, an interior sense, based on the things we know from the word, so that we can hear the voice of the Lord speaking to us in a way that captures our attention and pulls on our heartstrings, but completely in freedom. The Lord doesn't want people following him who are unhappy to be taking his marching orders, but wishes for us to be able to listen and to hear and to obey and follow in the fullest state of freedom, because only in the fullest state of freedom can the Lord give us the fullest state of heavenly joy. These past several weeks, we've been following a program, a program called The Journey, reading materials and day by day, thinking about things. Are they true? Are they kind or are they useful? To serve the Lord in ways that will allow us to genuinely be free but process and understand the things that come to us that we may be useful to others, truly kind. So this morning we hear about the story of King Solomon being pulled by the heartstrings, by the connection he had with his many, many wives and concubines. We may be distracted just thinking about that scene a time so different from our own and in a place so far away. And yet it represents all the multifaceted things within our own lives that want to tug and pull us away from the Lord. We each have our favorite mental or spiritual mistress, concubine, wife, idea that we're married to, things that keep pulling us back away from the things of the Lord, 
The Lord, on the other hand, asks us to enter into a marriage relationship. Blessed are those who come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord is trying to weave together in our hearts, marry those things of goodness and truth, that our hearts may be strong in listening, following, and carrying out His will. That we turn over our own will freely to the Lord. In the parable that is used to discuss this story in the program that we're following, it mentions, and we talked about this several weeks ago, the parable of the vineyard, where this person who owns the vineyard calls people to work at the beginning of the day, the middle, the afternoon, the evening, the late evening, and they all get paid the same. We talked about that four weeks ago. The injustice, the apparent injustice, of the Lord's heavenly kingdom where he wants to give each one of us, each one of us, no matter where we come from, no matter where we are in our path of life, he wants to give everybody the most joy they can receive. They all receive the same amount. We all will receive the exact same amount, all the joy of heaven that we can possibly use. And the appearance in the literal sense is just unfair. But when you think about it, do you want the Lord to press into you more heavenly joy than you can take? Well, that sounds like, well, it might be good, right? No. If the Lord pushed more into your heart than you could possibly receive in freedom, you would simply be being led around by external things or interior things from the Lord that wouldn't be of His will. We sometimes want more than we really can use or need. We go back then to that prayer used as the opening sentence. Give your servant, O Lord, an understanding heart to discern between good and evil. And as we begin to discern, the Lord will give us just enough truth to match the desires of our heart to do that which is good. The Lord never gives us more truth than we can bear. The Lord never forces upon us more good than we can stand. We're blessed to see scenes presented to us from the Word. Scenes from heaven, the world of spirits, and even from hell. To give us examples of how these things that are taught in the Word can be applied in our own lives. There is the scene in the beginning of heaven or conjugal love, but also repeated in true Christian religion, of people who have ideas of what heavenly life is. In the end, they all realize that unless they're useful, heaven is not a very fun place at all. Having conversations and parties and perpetual singing and playing music, having worship all the time, they think this is the reward of heaven. The Lord will pump down into my heart these blessings of praise, And after a day or two, oh my goodness. Even you, sitting in the pew, listening to a preacher giving a fantastic sermon, can only take it for so long. Preachers know this. You know it. You can only receive so much at a certain state, and then your state is full. Then you need to take what you hear and apply it. You need to take what you know and use it. You need to take what you hear and not just hear it, but truly listen to the implications of the Word of God that you may take it out into usefulness. Certainly that applies in the other world as well because the teachings that are given to us now are taken from the other world. And we're told in the other world there are angels who will receive everybody into their heavenly kingdom, into their society, and people come and they think, this is fantastic. There's one illustration of a person who thought, this is a wonderful heaven. I see people are running around naked. It looks so sweet. He thought, I'm not lascivious. I have innocence. I love my wife innocently well on earth. So why don't I join this heaven, a celestial heaven, the most beautiful interior heaven where it's like little babies are so sweet from a distance. These angels are just so darling. And as you get closer to them, 
They appear to you and they talk to you. They don't have clothes on. Well, this person was brought into that society and for a little while, he did okay. And then the genuine desires of his heart became to be seen, came to be seen. And he fell, it says, he fell into a swoon. If you've ever fainted, you know what falling into a swoon is. If you ever become lightheaded when you're getting up, you know what a swoon is. If you ever can't breathe very well, you know what a swoon is. This person fell into a swoon because all that heavenly joy of innocence in this heavenly society wasn't right for him. He really wasn't in tune, attuned to that kind of celestial, genuine, angelic love. And it wasn't because the people were naked. It was because his heart wasn't prepared and would never be prepared. It wasn't his state. He couldn't genuinely receive that which was being given to this angelic society. We each can look around and see things that can become very attractive to us and think, if I just had that, I'd be genuinely happy. King Solomon, in the story that we read from our lesson, had that problem. Being pretty powerful, being very, very rich, being really wise, too, at least for a while, he looked around at all the goods of the earth and he represents the Lord loving all different aspects of the things that are in us. All people, no matter who we are, are loved by the Lord. And so in his prime, King Solomon stands for that universal love from God to go out to everyone. Sadly, in the story, in the literal sense, it's turned because King Solomon began to be seduced by the things that are represented by the many wives and concubines, by the many, many things out in the world. He couldn't be made genuinely happy by following those gods and goddesses of the nations around him. The Lord knows that and said to Solomon, to Moses, to the children of Israel, do not follow the gods of the other nations into the land where you're going that you'll find. Do not follow those gods. Follow the Lord your God. Many of us think we can be happy when we look at somebody else's happiness and think, I'll have that. Give me one of those, please. The Lord asks us, asks us to listen with our heart to the things that we need and to ask the Lord for the things that we need so that we can do our calling. How hard it is not to look around at other people's lives and think, if I just had what they have, I would be happy. How many people, especially in a society where we're encouraged to feel a sense of entitlement, where we want to know that we are privileged, and indeed we are, can we take a humble approach in our hearing of what the Lord wants for us to be able to say, I want to serve you in the way that's most full no matter who else has what else. Which takes us back to that parable where at the end of the day, those who had only worked for an hour got their heavenly full, and those who had worked all day long through the heat of the sun thought they should have had what these people had. More. More per hour than what they got. The Lord asks us to look, especially into our hearts, to start even with external things, to ask ourselves, what do we genuinely need? Because oftentimes we can spiritually whine, or actually physically whine, just grumble, and it can be a challenge for many people just not to complain. To ask ourselves sometimes, if we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Simple thing to ask ourselves, what do we really need? The Lord, many, many times in meeting people, asks them, what do you need? What do you want? But more importantly, what do you need? Are we hungry? Do we need our bodies or our minds fed something? And we're cranky or a little bit upset or irritable because our bodies or our minds aren't responding with natural or spiritual protein to help us function? Are we upset? Are we angry? Has somebody done something to us that we are carrying a resentment? 
And is that why we're responding in a different way to somebody else? Why we might have barked at a coworker or a partner or a child, and they didn't do anything. But we're just angry at something else, and, and we're responding, and we're not listening to either ourselves or our affections or heart. We're not listening to other people's needs. And to try to work on what it is that's genuinely upsetting us and see where it's coming from. Are we lonely? It's good to stop and think. How do we feel about our relationship with other people? The famous prayer of Francis Assisi asks that we learn to become listeners more than seek to be listened to. And it goes on to compare various things that we might want these things, but let's be the person who can give those things first. Let's be a good listener. And that, of course, starts with listening to the Lord and having a communion, having a relationship where the Lord actually is touching our souls, meeting our needs, actually being and dwelling within us so that we're not spiritually we're not emotionally lonely for the Lord. Many, many times that involves going somewhere else to someone where the Lord can speak to your heart from their heart. How much time do we spend in the Lord's Word seeking out what does the Lord say to us? Or entering into a conversation with someone else to find out, is there something about my loneliness, my sense of connection or disconnection from others that can be solved by me connecting me going out to someone else so that I may connect with them. Perhaps I, you, can be the connection to the Lord for somebody else. For indeed, that is exactly how all of heaven operates and is the same for all of the church. That we be in the grand human, the grand body of the Lord. To be able to do those works, those functions of serving other elements, other parts of the grand man or the grand human of heaven. So we all are there, we're all here to serve something else and someone else from the Lord in us. Hungry, angry, lonely, disconnected, wishing to truly become an important person to the Lord serving others. Each of us wants to have that sense of connecting to the Lord in the lives of somebody, making a difference. And if we don't have that sense, Somewhere along the line, it's been stolen from us. It's not the same thing as everybody being special, but there's an element of that. But that idea that we make a difference in the lives of our community, and that we will be missed if we're gone, if we're not here. So the Lord asks us to consider, what is our place among others? No man is an island, the saying goes. And the Lord did not create anybody to just exist on their own. The Lord didn't create any community or family simply to exist on its own. Any church, any country, any world. All are meant to exist and to take care of themselves, but for the sake of the other. This is an important spiritual quality that has to do with what truly the Lord communicates into our minds and hearts and what makes that circle out into our will. That we commit, connect with other people, that the Lord's will within us can be our will with others. Finally, in that little acronym, halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we have to ask ourselves, what is it and when is it that the Lord asks us to rest? The commandments help us understand what it is we are to seek to do. And one of the commandments, a really important commandment, a very early commandment right away says to stop and take rest. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested from all his labors. The Lord asks us to stop and pause and rest. And we're here today on a Sunday. We're observing the Sabbath. We don't just observe it by physically showing up. We observe it also by slowing down spiritually in order that we may stand still and seek the Lord. That we may be quiet and meditate upon the things of God. Now, if the sermon 
or the church service becomes too quiet, people will enter into a state deeper than just quiet. They may begin to actually sleep. You may think, well, I've never slept in church. How do you know? You were probably asleep when it happened. And people often ask me, Pastor, doesn't it bother you when you see people asleep in church? And I never am bothered if I see you sleeping in church. Because this might be the one time when you feel really safe, secure. One time when you're with your best friends, you feel at home. The one time when you've come and you've brought all your burdens to the Lord like he asks you to do. And you may be tired. As our bodies age, it's harder to stay awake for the whole day anyway. And the pews aren't the most comfortable place to sit, but considering that you're coming before the Lord and you're with friends and you're in a safe place, when I see people falling asleep in church, I wish they were listening to the Word of God or my preaching, but I'm also very happy that people have come to church and feel comfortable enough to just rest in the Lord. King Solomon asked for an understanding heart. And that's not an excuse for you all to take a nap now. <laughs> King Solomon asked for an understanding heart that he may judge what's good and bad. We all ask that we may listen to the Lord. Not just listen to know, but listen to obey. So the Lord may fill up our hearts, as it said in the second lesson, that we may be full with the good things of the Lord, pressed down, shaken together, good measure. And most importantly, that we may take these good things that the Lord gives us and that we may do to others as we would have them do to us. Amen. Please rise.